A very good morning and welcome to the ODPP Cafe. My name is Anita Onuko. I'm your host for the show. The show is brought to you courtesy of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. Today must be our 68th or 67th episode, not sure which, but we have done so well, over 50 episodes so far. Uh, the show has been here to uh, educate you, to inform you, to talk to you about the criminal justice sector, and to tell you what to do when in contact or in conflict with the law because at some point in time, utapatikana. And so we are here to talk about these days. Uh, you can also be one to advise someone in case uh, your relative or your friend is in trouble with the law. Uh, this show is all about education, all about information. So I invite you to watch us, to engage with us, and ask questions. Uh, we are on Facebook at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions Kenya. We are on Twitter at ODPP underscore KE. We are also on YouTube where we are also live at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. So Karibu Sana, you can follow us, subscribe, invite a friend, invite a friend, and let's engage. <coughs> so as always, we start with a quick sneak into the courts today. Not so many stories. Our disclaimer usually is we are not going to give you a whole rundown of the courts, but just a few cases <coughs> that we've selected for today. And I start with a case about three Chinese, uh, three Chinese men. Quite an interesting case. Um, three Chinese <coughs> are charged for defrauding a fellow Chinese. I laughed when I read this, quite interesting. So three Chinese nationals facing charges of defrauding a fellow Chinese investor of 320 million in Kitui County have been remanded after failing to meet strict bond terms set by a Mwingi court. The suspects Li Chuan Chen, Le, Le Lei Chen and Chizao Zin were on Wednesday remanded at Waita uh, prison in Mwingi after failing to get a Kenyan surety of two million and a bond of similar amount. So three Chinese in court were trying to defraud, to defraud their fellow Chinese. The court declined to release them on a cash bill and insisted they get a Kenyan surety after counsel for the complainant Edaman Properties, Peter Munyoki, argued that the suspects were likely to skip court and flee the country if freed on simple bond terms. We've talked about bail and bond on this show, and I know we're going to do it again next year, that there are conditions that are normally set, and if you don't meet the conditions, then you're likely to, to fail to get bail and bond. So that was the first story for us today. The second one, I think you've seen it also on social media, quite sad. A former OCS is charged with sexual harassment of a junior cop. Former Kamkunji OCS, Chief Inspector Samir Yunus, has been charged in an Nairobi court with raping a police <coughs> woman at Dandora police station three years ago. However, Mr. Yunus denied the offense before Milimani Chief Magistrate Wendy Kagendo. His lawyer, Mr. David Ayuo, applied for him to be released on reasonable bond terms, arguing that he is. Oh, let me, let me tell you. Let me drop that too fast. That is a senior police officer who is still in service. We shall have a few uh, minutes to talk about that because the show today is about GV GBV. Uh, Ms. Kagendo then directed Mr. Yunus to plead the charge as drafted. After denying the charge, Ms. Kagendo freed him on 500,000 bond with an alternative of 200,000 shillings. The case will be mentioned on December 22nd for pretrial. Another sad one as well, and maybe the ladies here will have a bit to say about that. Court overturns defilement sentence. A Meru court has overturned a 15-year sentence meted on a border border rider who married a 16-year-old girl, saying she deceived the man that she was an adult. While making a ruling on an appeal lodged by Mr. Hussein, who had been convicted of defilement, the judge noted that the two had been living openly as man and wife. Justice Cherere ruled that mere evidence that the complainant was 16 years did not confirm that she was <coughs> below 18 years and has allowed the appeal only on that account. I can feel the eyes on me here. I know with Konamaoni. <laughs> um, the other story we have here is about the Egerton um, Vice Chancellor. He's been jailed for dis disobeying court order. The Egerton University uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Isaac Ibuage, and eight of the institution's council members have been sentenced to one month imprisonment after they were found guilty of contempt. The nine will, however, not serve the sentence should they each pay a fine of 100,000 
slapped on them by the courts. So that's about Egerton. Depends on where you went to school, you could be calling it Egerton. <laughs> the matter would be mentioned on 15th December 2022. So those were just the four cases we wanted to highlight for the show. Our show is not very long, so we can't also bring to you everything that has happened in court. I know you're all caught up with how things have been happening in the court, especially because of social media and the power of um, instant news and news is everywhere all the time. So, Karibuni Tana, Kabisa Kabisa to the show. Today we want to talk about 16 days of activism. Uh, you know, November 25th to December 10th, the world has been marking 16 days of activism against GBV and uh, Kenya has been uh, doing so as well. And we are here because we are, or days, the, the last day, not day zero, the last day is tomorrow, about uh, with the 16 days of activism. So I have an all-female panel, and the disclaimer we start is that it is not because we don't recognize the boy child, uh, but we have a female panel who have very interesting stories and very interesting perspectives about GBV. And I want to start the show by allowing them to introduce themselves. Tanza Jackie, please Thank introduce you. yourself and tell us um, what you do. <coughs> Thank you very much, and thank you to the ODPP for um, this session. Mm -hmm. My name is Jackie Mutere, and uh, I come from an organization that I initiated called Grace Agenda, okay. Grace Meaning Strength. It was initiated as a response to the post-election violence of 2007-2008, yeah. uh, where I was violated also, and as a result of it, I conceived and had a child uh, who is now 14 years old. Uh, my work uh, has is been around reparations for sexual violence and uh, and um, uh, support for the children that were born in the sexual violence. Mm. The, I think, let me leave. Let, let yes, me, we'll catch up with you in yes, a bit again. Yes. Karibu sana, <coughs> tell us who you are and what you do. Asante, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. My name is Elsie Milimu. I work at Crew Kenya, uh, which is a women's rights organization that advocates for women and girls. Um, and yeah, I work as a program officer, mm -hmm. primarily on GBV, access mm -hmm. to justice. Yeah. Why are we in orange? Orange? The world? Yes. 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 What yes, is it yes. about? It's part of the 16 days of activism um, kind of theme. Mm -hmm. This year, the theme, primarily the theme is Orange the World, Unite as Activists. Mm -hmm. And ideally what we are doing is not necessarily saying GBV doesn't, you know, take place 365 days of the year. Mm -hmm. It's just a highlight, you know, kind of creating a lot of awareness and you know part of that is trying to seek commitments mm. um, from state on how we can uh, prevent and and also and, respond yeah. yeah i think i had the president say during the mcj launch that we need to end sdbv and we'll talk about how yes. far we are or if that is possible exactly. and in other news we get to the church at your orange <laughs> 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 My name is Njoki Mwangi. Mm -hmm. uh, today I'll, I think I'll present two of the organizations that are me. So the first one is Tawi Wellness. It's a mental health organization, more of counseling. Mm -hmm. We deal with marriage issues, family, children, and adolescents. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one that I represent women. It's called Nyamam Sokos Limited. Mm -hmm. It's a platform of about 1,000 women. Mm -hmm. It started as a, an e-commerce mm -hmm. platform. I didn't get the name, sorry. Nyayo Moms, ah. Nyayo Moms okay, okay. Sokos Limited. Mm -hmm. And in Nyayo Moms, majorly I deal with issues of wellness, mental wellness, okay. and anything legal. Mm -hmm. So it's still, we realize, even as much as you're doing business, mental health is important. Yeah. Yes. Is a marriage unit under siege? How many social media issues? <laughs> uh, <laughs> issues are there, they have to be addressed. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes when issues are talked about, then people think things are going haywire. But mm -hmm. they are always there. It's only that people are not talking now about Now we are them. getting to hear about them more often. More often, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Karibu Sana Kibasho. Thank you. Wango, Karibu. Um, thank you, Anita. Uh, my name is Wangu Kanja, founder and executive director of Wangu Kanja Foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, Wangukanja Foundation was, uh, I, I set up Wangukanja Foundation in 2005 after going through a repo deal and the challenges I faced informed uh, setting up of Wangukanja <coughs> Foundation to support survivors, uh, men, women, boys and girls. Uh, and then we, 
we focus purely on sexual violence, prevention, protection, and response. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we must support survivors to access justice, but also restore their dignity. Mm -hmm. Because when you go through rape, uh, the person takes your dignity away, mm -hmm. but then working towards ensuring that we restore that dignity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <coughs> Our host. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Jaggi, mm -hmm. the head of uh, SGBB division, and I'm also a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to be here. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy because today we need to hear the voices mm -hmm. uh, of very many people who cannot speak. But through Grace Agenda and Wango Kanja Foundation, mm -hmm. as well as Tawi, we'll be hearing. We need to. Uh, hear these voices so that we can also uh, get them access to justice yeah. through prosecution. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we start with you, Jackie, and maybe because you already had started talking about the Grace Foundation. Uh, just what's the background? My and I'm glad you mentioned that it came about as a result of the post election violence. Yeah. So maybe now uh, just a bit of background about the Grace Foundation okay. and why it was called Grace. Okay, it's, it was thought, it, um, I thought of many names, I thought of what I uh, wanted it to represent, yeah. but eventually, it, after having gone through my personal work, my personal counselling, I thought it, it uh, needed to reflect strength and resilience, mm -hmm. and hence um, uh, I gave it the name Grace, and Grace is actually another name in, in the Greek vocabulary, meaning strength. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. that is how it came about. Mm -hmm. uh, and. <coughs> it also came about because, first of all, we also realized that um, after the post-election violence of 2007-2008, there were a lot of uh, responses towards uh, IDPs, towards uh, uh, people, who had been valued, people who had lost their lives, people who had lost their property, yes. uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and wealth, mm -hmm. and cattle, and stuff like that. But nobody th th thought about sexual violence. Yeah. And so I thought to myself, and since I had gotten a child with it, and I knew the trauma that I had worked for, for initially three years, of processing this pain because I now had a child uh, to live with, what it had cost me. And I thought to myself um, that I must speak out. Why? Because I was seeing other people related to the post-election violence being compensated mm -hmm. or being recognized, but nothing had been done about sexual violence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I just got myself into the system and I realized, so I, we, we in, initially we used to be invited to functions to speak. Um, but then I also realized that we became guinea pigs because we'd only be invited just so that people can show the extent of the violence yeah. and what it was and what it is represented. Mm -hmm. But then I also realized that our voices were being lost in it because we were just we were just there to we were we were museum we were pieces. Props. Yeah, we were just props. And I thought that that was out of order. Yeah. And so we came together uh, together. Actually, we about three other women, and uh, we thought of uh, coming up in a comprehensive way. So initially, also when I I met a lot of other survivors. Uh, because I participated in the TGRC process, the Truth, Justice yeah. and Reconciliation um, Commission process. Mm -hmm. I met with a lot of survivors at that time and <coughs> they had also had children. Mm -hmm. So I said, but who is speaking for these women? Mm -hmm. Who is speaking for these people? Uh, and then that's when we decided to organize. So I thought about, first of all, my focus was on the children. And so we brought together, we had a couple, um, the initial counseling session was a, a cup of tea and uh, having the children play together. But because of the trauma, the rejection, the neglect that those children had come had come through, mm. I um, it was it did not it was no longer now about um, them, because I realized that first of all I, I, I thought that I would start with the mother, no I'd start with the children because yeah. my focus was on the children yeah. and I wanted them to bring a change up because I was so concerned because they, uh, because of the, the environment in which they, mm. they they lived in, and then listening to them and the way they were so violent to each other they were so. They were very forceful to each other. I thought that this is this is a, a, a product of what they are also receiving. Yeah. And so I thought that now I just needed to re, to rethink my, my strategy. Yeah. And then I started focusing on the women instead. Yeah. And I realized that was a better strategy. Yeah. And um, fast forward, uh, we, uh, we came to realize that our mandate was specifically, first of all, self-agency. <coughs> Because um, uh, during that time, a lot of NGOs would want would have wanted to speak for us. Yes. Uh, or with the, as I as you have said, we used to come as as props. Mm. 
and uh, we thought that it was also very undignified. And then above all else, um, many of the women came from very vulnerable yeah. backgrounds. And they would go home with the pittance, whereas the NGOs were having it, it, it we were the new kid on the block yeah. in terms of the conflict. Mm. And so there were a lot of in, in, interventions and a lot of money that, at that time. So I thought it was also unfair. And mm. I thought it was the best way to go about it was to have an amplified voice. Mm. That is why I started it. Yeah. But key to this conversation, I need to tell you that um, one of the things um, during the Kenya National Dialogue uh, reform process, mm -hmm. uh, two months uh, when after the after the post-election violence, yes. the initial dialogue conversation, one of the key things was about police reforms. Yes. And uh, during police reforms, there was something called police complaints, mm -hmm. which I participated in. Mm -hmm. And we got complaints reforms for about 82 women. Mm -hmm. um, all of them had been violated sexually. Many of them, um, a few of them, many of them actually, half by police officers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought that it would be in order just to uh, present ourselves, uh, to, to present this case, to the commission at that time, it was the police, uh, the police commission. Yeah. It was headed by Kavludi at that time, right. um, and uh, I don't know that we, we, since many of us did not have actually the documentation to take ourselves to court, and uh, uh, there was no other reprieve. We knew that there was something called reparation that needed to, that that could have been done for yeah. us, and so we participated in the process because we wanted them to know that this was a, a serious issue. Mm. and we wanted to bring it on the table. Mm. It has been 14 years, and today I'm glad that this is one of the conversations where at least we, the, the sexual violence is on the table. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just before I go to you, uh, I want to understand, and for the sake of William Fanatuona, what is reparation? Reparation is actually, I'm simplifying it. Yes. Repairing the lives of the women and, survi and survivors. Let me say that, because now it's not about men, women. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not survivors. about the gender. It's, it's really just about the survivors. Yeah. Uh, reparations is a, a form of, um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's about five prompt. There's compensation, there's acknowledgement, there's recognition, there's restitution, uh, and, uh, and there's, there's another one. Uh, yeah. uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entire package that you give or that you present mm. or, that you, or that you give to a survivor yeah. um, as a... As a as a form of healing in the, in, in the, to restore their dignity. Restore their dignity. Yes, and also, it is usually, when also you do not have actually the, a, a court case, when there's actually no <laughs> litigation, yeah. but it's the process where you recognize and you want to restore the dignity of lives, the, the, the dignity of lives of the, of the survivors, and also to bring them back on board and to realize and to <laughs> acknowledge specifically the violation. Yeah. That is what reparations yeah. do. And just to say, quick, mention quickly, yeah. that it, uh, initially, we knew we wanted something, but we did not know what it was. Okay. But later on, after also going through a process of capacity building and uh, association yeah. with the uh, International Center for Transitional Justice, mm -hmm. we knew that what we wanted no, was reparations. Want reparation. But now Grace Agenda's specific yeah. mandate mm -hmm. is uh, reparations for sexual violence, mm -hmm. which is self-agency. Um, uh, uh, Gosh, how can my mandate disappear from my head? <laughs> 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 Don't worry, who's supposed to do the reparation? <laughs> who, which, which is the government, government, government. Is, government is the one who repairs the lives because it is the responsibility of the state to mm. protect yes. uh, its citizens. Maybe I'm looking for which arm of government should. The whole the entire, uh, the, the, the entire government, but maybe it can, it could have been put under special programs, the way all the other yes. programs are put on. <laughs> yeah. It could have been put through, uh, through there. Yeah. But then uh, beyond that, in 2015, His Excellency, the President, after uh, some form of consideration, released the 10 billion Justice Restoration Fund, which was meant to actually support survivors, uh, and not only of sexual violence, but from the, from the pre-independence mm. stage up oh, to, wow. yes, mm. that was what it was all about 2015. Yeah. Mm. But then something happened. Things uh, happened. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, because of uh, the organization you represent, yeah. uh, are we there yet? Are we doing well in terms of SGBV? Mm -hmm. Because when Jackie talks about uh, post election violence, mm -hmm. we see a lot and hear a lot of uh, these violations during that time. Yeah. So I don't know what we, what you have seen as an organization the last mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. Did we. How did I, um, I don't even know what about form, mm -hmm. but did we see a rise of SGBVs? Was it was it the same as the years before? Was mm -hmm. it different? Yeah, I think I must uh, commend Kenyans this time round. Mm -hmm. um, but also, there was a lot of work that had gone um, into preparing for the elections, and a lot of um, interagency. By that I mean there was a lot of work between the CSO sector mm -hmm. and the state, particularly the police. Mm -hmm. And so, really, the police were really willing to, you know, work with us, um, have us set up. Numbers are crazy. 
rather talk about 80. Exactly, yeah. Um, but I would say generally in comparison to before, um, these elections were uh, not as... Yes, yes, yes. And it's because we, you know, we, were, we were ready, that is, to prevent um, and work closely and just be able to report and monitor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about now the work. Uh, the work yeah. yeah. Um, I remember you had, us, uh, you had mentioned something about where are we generally yeah. in terms of uh, GBV and access to justice for survivors, yes. that is. Yeah. Um, as a country, we've made um, you know, a number of strides, mm -hmm. a lot more commitments, mm -hmm. I must say. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of implementation, we are still lacking. Mm -hmm. Two uh, of the biggest challenges, of course, would be the length of time um, that matters take in court, particularly the matters we're talking about, um, um, the GBV cases. Yes. Uh, it's something that is, you know, it's traumatizing every time you have to court and as the, you have to go to court and as the, you know, as the matter proceeds on, it's, 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 it's a time to actually heal mm -hmm. as opposed to bringing that up. Mm -hmm. And so you find that matters are taking too long. And so that is one of, of the issues. And also a lot of the access to justice, um, you know, actors, a lot of it is, you know, there's paralegals there who are actually volunteering their time. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of effort and time put into ensuring survivors access justice. Mm -hmm. And so for it to take that, that long really is an injustice to survivors. I'll also speak to, you know, uh, one of the cases, for instance, that you mentioned. I mean, it's a it's a slap in the face for survivors the with such in Europe, right? exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, for such for such um, convictions to be overturned, mm -hmm. uh, because it 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 clearly shows that there is a lack of uh, survivors' voice um, that people are not you know are not listening to, mm -hmm. and we you know we've spoken about this, and as a country, you know, you have the GF commitments. Um, which are really, really, you know, really good, really uh, flowery. But in reality, you know, what are we doing? We've taken several steps back, several years back. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll, I think I'll, I'll speak to, to that as a challenge. But also, there's a lot of focus on, you know, when you talk of access to justice, for survivors, it's different. Um, survivors need, you know, holistic uh, care. Yeah. And uh, part of that is psychosocial support as well, yeah. um, which is something that really, and I, and I know my sister here yeah. will highlight, yeah. uh, but it's something that really people aren't, aren't concerned about. Yeah. Um, and that's where, again, the conversation for shelters comes in. Because yeah. how can you, you know, how can you take, uh, for instance, a defiled child back to the same house? The same house. So, and there's a need for that. Yeah. So access to justice for survivors is really multifaceted. Yeah. And it's a conversation that I'm sure will, you know, will come out of this. Yeah. But it's something that needs to be spoken about. Yeah. So that then this is something that is, you know, it's different. It's, it's um, and particularly sexual, you know, sexual violence. It's, it's different and it's unique. It's not, it is, it is not for us to say, um, you know, it's a, it's a crime against morality. Um, it is, it's, 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 it's different and that's why it was enshrined in a, you know, in a Sexual Offences yeah. Act. And that's because of what the survivor has gone through. It's, it's something that, you know, that doesn't leave them. It's something they have to live with forever. And I think even when you go to court, you'll hear of survivors say, I wish I had yeah. died. I wish he had even killed me. Yeah. Because it's something you have to live with. Yeah. And that is something that I think from the recent, you know, the recent cases and recent judgments, we can see is not, you know, is not coming out from the court. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even before you reach court, yeah. the cost of accessing justice exactly. for an SDBV, um, Victim. Yeah. And we just have a talk about it a bit. Yeah. Um, I think one time we were in Kuali and you've been told about the cost of accessing mm -hmm. justice mm -hmm. for an SDBV victim. You are a Mamamboga in Kuali. You have gone through an ordeal. So Lazimo Funge Kibana, your kids depend on it. You are depending on it. And this is like real life cases now. Police. Then now, because you're vulnerable, even he may cut a corner with you, mm -hmm. does whatever he needs to do with you. And then now, this is a story of a woman who was telling. And then now she has to walk all the way to the police station and again mishandled. So, Una Juliza, did I really have to report? Mm -hmm. So maybe one of the things that needs to be looked at again is the cost of accessing uh, justice for SGBV. But I don't know, so how do you compare Kenya to other countries? in terms of how far we've come. Like uh, TZ, Uganda, our neighbors too. Oh, from our neighbors, we are, yeah. we are <laughs> quite some steps ahead, yeah. uh, I must say. Okay. Um, I think we are, you know, we are progressive as a nation. And of course, it's a lot, a lot is, has to do with, you know, the voices in the room. 
um, this this work began a long time ago. Uh, the women before us yes. um, who are now sitting in very high places that mm. you know that started this work. So mm. I must say, um, in terms of in comparison, then yeah, yeah Kenya is really uh, commendable. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Aya, Njoki. Yes. Karibu san. Thank you. You start by telling us about Stawi and what made you, I mean, take the turn from law to counseling and, of course, getting involved in the mental wellness of uh, people around us. Okay, so I'm an advocate of the High Court. Mm -hmm. This should be my 19th year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like you stopped practicing law? I actually stopped at some point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This year, then oh. I renewed my practicing certificate mm -hmm. because of another different event <laughs> that okay. maybe I'll talk about yes. another time. Yeah. But majorly, um, my experience, and I think my mind was just in the judiciary, really wanted to be a judge, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and then things happened. Uh, my mom had been very sick for some time, and I think I, I hadn't dealt with her sickness well. And by the time she was passing away, it really affected me, and I hadn't dealt with it. So there are certain events, if, uh, for example, my mom died out of the country, by the time she's coming back in Bari, then the dynamics of being a firstborn, you yeah. know, our culture, you're told, Ka kanguru, silie, yeah. and kind of you try to play that person. And, and of course, after you bury what happens, mm. you're left like that. Yeah. And for me, I, I lost interest in mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And things, I just lost interest. And, and, and it's important to say, and maybe, and I, I really admire the stories that Wango and Jackie bring yeah, here, because there are mm -hmm. certain events that make your life to go in a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. And when all these things and these things are happening, there are other areas of your life that yeah. are being affected. And in between also, you can see, because of the loss I'm experiencing, also my marriage is getting affected. Mm. I'm a young mom. I'm not able to handle a child. Mm. And then one of my friends told me, let's go and learn how to parent. <laughs> so I entered a class. Oh, there is a class for parenting. I went for parenting <laughs> class. <laughs> yeah. and, and I didn't have money. She said, una need to sotano. Oh. Eh, so nikaenda sa sotano, nikaenda. Eh. And, and I went to the class. I thought we were going for a normal parenting class. And the class was called Child and Adolescent Counseling. Oh. Wow. Mm. And I went there and I sat. And for the first time, I actually realized there are actually issues from my childhood that I hadn't dealt, dealt with. with. And probably that is also what had pushed me yeah. to be a lawyer, mm. <laughs> oh. to fight, you yeah. know. And, and from that, that point, now I went on and on and on and on until my master's, mm -hmm. and it, it just became a different place. Yeah. And, and we decided to form, to form Starry Wellness mm -hmm. to address mental health issues. Because now we can see the relationship. There's a difference between individual counseling, mm -hmm. but when you're dealing with family and marriage, you can pick issues from even conception, mm -hmm. how the environment affected you, your parents' relationship. If you are in an abusive family, there are certain ways that this thing will affect mm -hmm. your relationships coming. Mm -hmm. So that's how Stawi started. Mm -hmm. But I've also gone back, uh, back to law because of certain issues of injustice mm -hmm. that, that I want to push. Okay. Yes. Oh, interesting. Karibu sana. I think your, your parenting class. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we need to yeah. here. So wh what are you interested in, like the SGBV uh, space? What are you doing about SGBV as Stawi? Oh, so the issues of, as you know, and then I was, I was, as I'm saying, the everything, for example, if you're doing about, we go deep, if you're doing even premarital, you go deep into somebody's background and you realize this person, there's an issue they didn't deal with in their childhood. Maybe they were molested as a child, it could be a male or a female, and these things will affect their marriages. Yeah. They will affect how they deal with other relationships yeah. with their workers and co-workers. Yeah. Many issues that we deal in marriage also, a couple will come, they have issues in their marriages. And when you do a background check, you ask a person, tell me about your family, where you were born. You ask this person. You can see there are certain pointers yeah. that this issue does not start now. This issue started a long time ago. Mm. So you find that all those things, and because also we are dealing with children and adolescents, there are many issues that are, are coming up. And I was talking with Jackie before and saying, how many boys am I handling in therapy who have been sodomized? Oh no. 
and they come to therapy because wamekuwa vichwa ngumu wamekataa shule their grades have dropped they have refused to go to school on opening day they have become sick so their parents are angry you have to go to school then you know you just know how we can be reactive the school you know it was so hard to get the school and the child is brought for therapy and when they're in therapy they tell you i have never told anybody you are the first person i am telling mm. issues of bullying sodomy they have never said mm. they could be in their third year fourth year mm. but they're saying it the first time and they don't have the courage to tell the parents yeah. what is happening mm. so as as we are talking about this i think my voice would be how are we dealing with even from our own houses yeah. from the schools we are in from the churches because all these things they have a mental health component yeah. in it yeah. people are going to depression they will commit suicide because of those things so it's not something that can be underestimated mm. it mm. is quite yeah. a lot of i saw a post on uh, social media that says at nakimbiza watoto we shall go for the two months we don't know who we are going to leave them there with oh, yeah. and so we need to be careful about that uncle that yeah. neighbor even the pastor so we'll come back to how do you tell your child this thing because lazima ndo shago at some point mm. but you can't be there all the time but mm. it's also interesting the people who actually molest people or sexual violence actually people within the family within the family setup it could be a sibling a cousin an uncle a pastor a house girl <coughs> i have so many boys who have been molested by house girls but who is talking about it no yeah so but then we'll talk about how do you then tell your child what to do mm. when now in contact with such a situation what do, how do they protect because out of one hour kila sa karibu sana and just tell us a bit of how you found yourself here where you are with this whole <laughs> organization going on and how your life changed yeah uh, okay so um, after going through rape in 2002 yeah. i actually went into depression for two and a half years mm. um, to mum to numb my pain i actually uh, took alcohol uh, and i was trying to figure out how do i how do i come to back to my normal mm -hmm. and there's no way you can come back to your normal you mm -hmm. have to find a way and of starting normal. yeah mm -hmm. to find um to start your healing journey mm -hmm. and then get to a new normal mm -hmm. um and because of those challenges because it starts right mm -hmm. at the family mm -hmm. um so when you disclose to your family and friends mm -hmm. everyone is like what do you mean mm -hmm. um and then there's this uh, perception that um if if you if you go out and this usually happens with a lot of uh, teenagers or young girls mm -hmm. where if you go out with someone if they buy you alcohol or food you owe them. then you owe them mm -hmm. uh if wakikutumia fair you owe them you owe them and for me it's um one of the things that we keep on having um in this conversation is if you're buying someone and you want something in return you have to give terms and conditions mm -hmm tell the person before even mm. by mm. the the alcohol or mm. food or kutuma fair mm. you have to tell them the terms and conditions so that they make an informed decision mm. um so when i came out publicly mm. uh one uh, labeling kulem sana lirepiwa kulem sana lirepiwa and for me it's not i who actually committed the crime it's other Somebody person else. we always victimize the and victim, and the victim mm -hmm. instead of holding the person who has committed the crime accountable, accountable. and we need to to shift uh the blame mm -hmm. to the person who has actually committed the crime because yeah. the the sexual offenses act mm -hmm. provides for accountability mm -hmm. and we need to bring that conversation um to where the family unit the community are so that they understand one if you um if you force someone to have a sexual relationship with you you're committing rape mm. um and we uh, and Jackie will actually yeah. emphasize on this because mm. we don't have sodomy under the law we have men and women are raped or boys and girls oh. are defiled uh -huh. uh because then if we keep on using sodomy yeah. we 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 am 
we are kind of creating a platform where, you know, the way people can't fathom or mm. can't digest an issue mm. so that it makes it easier for us to have this conversation. Mm. The, the, our context also is set up in such a way, issues of sex, sexuality, and sexual violence are hard conversations mm -hmm. to have. Mm -hmm. For me, I know God did not create sex to, for people to use sex to violate other people. Mm -hmm. It was created for enjoyment. It was created for uh, procreation. procreation. Mm -hmm. So why don't we use it in the, in the way that mm -hmm. you, it was intended yeah. uh, by God? Mm -hmm. um, and then also, uh, when a person comes out, it's difficult for a woman to come out and say I was raped. Yeah. Can you imagine how difficult it is for mm -hmm. a man to come out and say I was raped? Mm -hmm. And by going through that process uh, of the violation, mm -hmm. the person is taking away the dignity mm -hmm. of this person. Mm -hmm. And we are not saying it's animals who are coming from the forest to come and rape people. It's fellow individuals who are fellow human beings who are coming to rape people mm -hmm. and also subject children to the same, mm -hmm. uh, to the same violation. Mm -hmm. And we are having so many issues in the community where we are saying children are being defiant, there's a, lo a lot of alcohol and drugs and substance abuse, but then as Kenyans, we are not asking ourselves, what is the underlying what problem? Has yeah. them there? And the problem might be people have gone through um, different uh, forms of uh, sexual and uh, sexual yeah. violence yeah. and for under Wangukanja Foundation the one thing um, and uh, going back to what Jackie had alluded earlier how do we amplify survivors voices how do we give them information to make informed choices because mm. it's about their agency their choice and also their voice mm. uh, uh, because we take that away from them. Mm. We speak on their behalf, mm. yet we can provide a platform mm. for them to say, mm. this is what I want. Mm. Um, we also rush survivors through the criminal justice system. Mm. So all of a sudden, end up a hospital, let a report, police, policy, policy uh, to find investigations, mm. we get the case to court. We are not helping the person to understand from the onset. Mm -hmm. These are some of the things that you need to do. Mm. One, if you've been raped, uh, go to a hospital to get a medical report. But the most important bit is for you to actually get the right uh, remedies. Mm. If the person who raped you has any sexually transmitted yeah. infection, it can be addressed early. Mm. Uh, if they didn't use a condom, because normally mm. there are those people who end up using condoms, <coughs> so that you can get uh, PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, and emergency contraceptive so that you don't conceive. But then we've made this conversation so difficult for people to digest it mm. to a point where it is even hard for survivors to go to hospital to seek medical yeah. intervention. Yeah. Uh, from there, you need to go to um, pol a police station to make a formal complaint mm. so that they can do the investigation and then they compile a file and which will be forwarded to DPP, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Peruse, and then it will yeah. be taken to court. Yeah. By us not helping survivors to understand and also managing the expectation mm -hmm. that it's going to be a lengthy process, this is what you need mm -hmm. to do, these are some of the challenges that we might face. <laughs> eh. So <laughs> if we don't do that, yeah. we end up setting uh, survivors for failure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see increasingly mm -hmm. survivors are not willing to report mm -hmm. and then also mm -hmm. the the way we discriminate unconsciously we focus too much on children and at times keep on saying boy child boy child and i wanted to ask you about that yes <laughs> my understanding is we are all human beings mm -hmm. and we are talking about human rights and because we're talking <coughs> about sexual violence let's make the conversation sexual violence we are violating human beings, whether it's a man, woman, child, child or yeah. a boy, boy or a girl. Yeah. So that mm -hmm. when we are looking for remedies, mm -hmm. we are looking for remedies on sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Not at now because children are being affected more. We start focusing on the children, then we forget the adults. Mm -hmm. Because I'll be honest with you, and maybe Jackie can attest to this, yeah. most of the women who, mm -hmm. are, who went through rape, uh, mm -hmm in 2007, 2013, and 2017, mm -hmm. did not come to report. Mm -hmm. The reason being, 
we stigmatize people, we discriminate people. And then there is a fear of wewe ni mama una tabia mbaya ama wewe ni prostitute. You you unafanya nini? Kuliko unafanya nini? And the constitution provides for you have the freedom to be anywhere because the state has provided security. Mm. So then why are we asking women kwani uliko umeenda kwa ofisi yake saa moja usiku? And the conversation around dress code going back to um, the way we discriminate people in terms of we focus and it's sad because we should address sexual violence as sexual violence. So we focus on children, we forget adults. Mm -hmm. Women, when you report, you are afraid of, if you go back to your husband and tell him, I went through rape, they, there's a likelihood that they are going to leave yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I know of men who've been raped, and when they disclose to their girlfriends, they're like, when I, I don't think a strong man can, can be go raped. through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we should uh, stay away from and stop doing is trying to address sexual violence in bits and bits yeah. where, where mm -hmm. we are saying uh, because children are being affected more let's focus on the children because then we are going to lose out on the adults. Mm -hmm. Right now I, I think even Jackie can uh, tell us ar around the statistics. They are receiving more cases on children than adults but that does not mean we happening. adults are not going through rape. Mm -hmm. They are going through rape. It's only that the lens that we are using to address sexual violence is creating that uh, perception, perception yeah. and also gap between yeah. them. And then going back to now the myths and misconceptions of oh, ningo fupi uliko mevas juinini. The youngest child who who has gone through um, sexual violence is three days old. So you tell me, Ningo Gani alikuwa meva, to say me, and you are quite raped. And then the uh, oldest is 105. Shoshua Navaji. Honestly. And then also, if we are saying peer dress code in a cause, why, um, why are men being raped? Because uh, if we start using uh, those justifications, then we are not being true to ourselves. Yeah. And then also, we are not willing to have hard conversations. Mm. Sexual violence is a hard conversation, but we must have. We must have and it. the one thing that we need to do is also what you are saying. How do we provide information to our children so that they make informed yes, choices? Yes. And when we are saying sex education, we are not teaching children how to have sex. Mm. It's actually just providing them with information so, aware. so that they are aware and then they make informed decision because if you don't do that then what happens is kuna so if you don't do that then kuna social media wa excuse watoto wote wakana gadgets so kuna sim kuna nini kuna tv kuna magazines your neighbor, if you don't talk to your child about at sex, at ongeleshwa na neighbor, what happens? They trust the neighbor more than they trust you because mm -hmm. you're not willing to mm -hmm. open up to talk, um, to talk and mm -hmm. have that conversation mm -hmm. with them. So we are the root cause mm -hmm. of what is currently happening in the country mm -hmm. when it comes to sexual violence. Yeah. And my focus is on sexual violence because tunatakanga kumeku vitu zikuwe sexy na that's why we want to say sexual and gender-based violence. It's just sexual violence. Sexual Let's violence. call it what it is. Yeah. Ni rape, ni rape. Ni rape. Now, at the end of the day, if yeah. we call things for what they are, then it becomes easier uh, to say, <coughs> so we are having issues na sexual violence. What are the remedies? Mm. And then also, the one thing that I think we need to put into consideration is coordination. We are re-traumatizing and re-victimizing survivors day in, day out. Mm. And this falls back to the government of Kenya. Mm. So if I go to health, I get a medical report. I go to security, I get a P3. I go to ODPP, they come and ask me. Like, every step of the way, now we the same questions. The same questions. Mm. And then we are duplicating efforts. So if we have a document um, at Ministry of Health and a document at Ministry of Interior, all these are government institutions. Mm. They need to come around the table and have conversations yeah. with survivors yeah. to 
avoid um, re-traumatizing and mm -hmm. victimizing uh, survivors, mm -hmm. but then also, how do we define, as Kenya, how do, how do we define coordination? Yeah. Coordination in any because I think if we understand coordination, then we will work towards a survivor-centered approach yeah. when developing like intervention, yeah. and also <coughs> it's going to be trauma-informed, mm. which we don't. Maybe we'll get there. Yeah. Tell us why you call Lady Wangu Kanja, first of all. Um, <laughs> Lady Wangu. But then we are sitting with royalty. So why do you call Lady Wangu? <laughs> um, March of this year, uh, the president of Italy, um, it's a knighthood under oh. the, the Italian yeah. uh, country mm -hmm. where the president sent um, the, it's called what, uh, the knighthood. Uh, for me to be presented because of the work that I'm doing mm. um, on sexual violence. Yeah. yeah it's, Who is the foundation it's based? Mukuru Kwa Ruben. Mukuru Kwa Ruben. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll keep on talking about this. I think you've said something very important about a trauma-centered approach to handling uh, SGBV. And now Jackie, our host, mm. you should <laughs> start by telling us SGBV, GBV, what's the difference? Because I'm also now <laughs> defining myself. I'm GBV, Nikisema is GBV, and it's supposed to be GBV, SGBV, what is the difference? Um, let me say, um, the reason why we call it um, SGBV is because it's a combination of sexual and, uh, you know, j um, the, the, the violation could be um, um, directed to an, uh, any form of gender, mm -hmm. male or female. But what is sexual violence? Uh, mm -hmm. Sexual violence is... Uh, a lack of a better word, uh, violation uh, of a sexual nature. Um, and it's uh, like Wangu has mentioned, is uh, it could be rape defilement, you know, mm -hmm. the sodomy quote in quote, or the defilement of a child, uh, you know, within a family setting. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, uh, the gender based violence could be physical, you know, mm -hmm. emotional. So the distinction is that when you talk about sexual violence, it has a sexual nature. Okay. When you combine it with gender, it could be sexual and gender at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I must say uh, one thing. Uh, we need to talk about the the data. Look at it. Uh, every, if you look at the six of us or five of us seated here, mm -hmm. one in every three uh, one in every three women has has faced gen, uh, a violence of any form. Mm -hmm. So to kiasabwa patatu moja wetu, or most likely all mm -hmm. of us. So that is how serious uh, gender, uh, sex and gender-based violence uh, is, and uh, it needs to be addressed uh, with the seriousness that it deserves. I know uh, today I'm very happy that we have Wango Kanja and, um, and uh, Jacqueline, my namesake, uh, who are here to speak for very many survivors who cannot speak, mm. who are here to show us as a prosecution and the state actors that vict uh, victims and survivors need to be handled with a lot of care mm. and, uh, and a lot of, you know, uh, respect. Mm. Um, not every person within uh, our society or even in our offices who handles SGBV cases mm. will uh, have, you know, the sensitivity the matter deserves mm -hmm. or the sensitivity that we should have when we're dealing with SGBV cases. So yeah, that okay. is where we are. So then how, you just got into a different conversation after that. Mm -hmm. So how do you prepare prosecutors to handle SGBV? Is it any prosecutor? Do I just come and say, <laughs> I want to handle GBV cases? Or should they be having a certain predisposition? Is there training? Because I think if yeah. I'm to give an SGBV docket, I think I'd be Children and SBV, I yeah. think I'll be crying every day. <laughs> so do I need to have a certain disposition to, to handle SGBV and is there training? Okay, um, initially when we got into government to work as prosecutors or state councils or wherever we are, uh, there was no, you know, you're just thrown in the deep end prosecution is prosecution. Mm. You go prosecute whether it's murder, sexual and gender-based violence, mm. or, you know, uh, corruption or everything. But mm. uh, as time has uh, been going on, is that uh, we, uh, we are now trying to, uh, we are identifying people who have, you know, an ill passion, watch an issue many passion, yeah, dealing with the sexual cases. Uh, right now, as ODPP, 
if you look at even the people we have uh, appointed as our focal persons, are people who have the interest of the survivors mm -hmm. at heart, mm -hmm. not just anyone. Yeah. But again, you also must appreciate when um, when you're employed in government, mm -hmm. um, there's never you're never given a choice. You're employed, sent to a department, you work, a karma transfer. You're taken to the SDBV division, you work. But uh, we are trying now to come out of that as uh, um, as uh, ODPP mm -hmm. and getting uh, to specialization. And especially for those sensitive mm -hmm. divisions, that's the children and SDBV division. Mm -hmm. And hoping maybe Vision 2030, we will have a fully-fledged uh, SDBV division with specialized prosecutor, mm -hmm. children's division with specialized prosecutor. And we are crossing our fingers because we already have the support from mm. the DPP. Yeah. Yes. Like in next about 2030, there's no end to it. <laughs> <laughs> I am I'm actually aligning, <laughs> aligning, it. It. <laughs> I'm aligning it with the government, you know, targets. Yes. Let me not uh, uh, be the person to give hope where they, you know, give hope of 20. 25 yeah. and it, it uh, we can see clearly it will not happen mm -hmm. at like that let us put it at the same uh, target with the government but it's also progressive mm -hmm. we have already started it so progressive and hoping by 2030 it will be fully open yeah, yeah. yeah. there was this conference in london uh, they were not talking about the other last week or something we were talking about sgbv and somebody brought an opinion piece saying the dpp should have spoken about reparations but then I'm asking Jackie, is it within the audit this province too? <laughs> That's what I kept asking. Which government yeah. agency mm -hmm. should we actually direct the discussion of reparation? Because this is Kenya. If you throw it open wide, it will just... Mm. Um, mm. I must say that uh, the matter's reparation uh, was directed to the Attorney General of this country, being uh, the advisor to the to, this, the, uh, to the president. Yeah. So uh, uh, the survivors, uh, are ex uh, the AG is expected to uh, advise the president um, in matters of uh, reparation. Yeah. So to just um, uh, uh, become a bit, um, uh, I know we've had a, a situation where people say, no, it's only Pippin Deli to Peleka Kotini na Ika Indelea then it should be the director of public prosecution. But um, uh, in, in the ideal situation and where the, the, the responsibility lies mm. is the office of the Attorney General. Ah, okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, you have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was even coming back to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, and now we just to shed a little bit of yeah. light on reparation. And I think it needs to be a simpler word. As I mean, a <laughs> trouble name. Repair. Yeah, repair. Restoring lives. <laughs> yeah. Repair. No, I, must say, lives. Um, I must say that even as we talk about reparations, you can't restore Only. someone yeah. yes. to where they were before the, yeah. the yeah. offense. Yeah. So it's just making them comfortable to be just, you know, closer to... Accountability. Mm -hmm. No, no apart from accountability, you, yeah. you see reparation can also come in the form of compensation. Mm -hmm. You're just restoring them to uh, a place where they are almost where they were mm -hmm. before the offense occurred. Yeah. So at Wezi Osafisha, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like a torn dress. Mm -hmm. Is it the same? Mm -hmm. It can never be the same. Yeah. The stitches will always show. Mm -hmm. It might not show publicly. My colleagues will not see where yeah. it is torn, mm -hmm. but I know that it is torn. Mm -hmm. And it can never be the same again. Mm -hmm. The reparations agenda or, uh, was something that was initiated at the TGRC process. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And um, it because it came out um, with the TGRC, it, it, the TGRC is a, a political document. Yeah. And so it's named a lot of people, were named inside um, uh, as, culp as culprits yes. in certain uh, mm. quarters. So the uptake was very difficult for it. Um, as uh, survivors of sexual violence during that time, and uh, as, as part of the TGRC process, we suggested that you extract the, extract the section on sexual violence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and deal with that one alone. Mm -hmm. Leave out the other politics mm -hmm. or, of it, okay? Yeah. Re remove the names, do what you expand names, mm -hmm. do repress, but just extract that, that particular chapter mm -hmm. and, and, and repair it. But beyond that, we participated with Kenya National Commission for Human Rights, when mm -hmm. you were there, uh, many other sexual violence uh, players and um, human rights violation players. 
and we developed a document. Uh, it was a draft document mm -hmm. on, rep on on reparations, yeah. and we even developed regulations. Mm -hmm. So it was something that, and, and it's even done the Attorney General's office right now mm -hmm. as we speak. Yeah. And uh, beyond that, even Honorable Gladys Wosheli had also come up with her own, mm -hmm. but she came up with her own after she read ours. Mm -hmm. That was not just she can say it all. <laughs> yeah. um, so <clears throat> Jackie had mentioned, J Jackie, Madam Prosecutor, had mm -hmm. mentioned the issue of um, the, uh, the, the, the voices of, of survivors. Mm -hmm. You know, people talk down to survivors yeah. or talk at survivors. Mm -hmm. And um, that is one of the reasons why they would rather withdraw. Because as Wango has said, end of hospital, end of policy. And it's an assumption that they want to go to court, that it should be taken to court. And you, defy, and you, and you find many cases, are also, they, they're also abandoned mid, mid, midstream, mm. simply because that was not the agenda. What, okay. would, what would the other agenda be, Jackie? Ask the survivor. Yeah. 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 You have to ask. Okay. Interventions being survivor-centered survivor and in the best interest, interest of, of the, the survivor. survivor. Mm. I, don't, I, I, might, I might want justice, but not that kind of justice. Mm. For example, the survivors that I deal with, many of them, um, in having dealt with the government programs, mm. many of them, what is reparation? I have spoken to them. What is repair to you? Give me money, I go my way. Government is not trustworthy. They'll say they'll do this, and they will not do it. Give me money. Others, what is it? Others, me, I want a medical, uh, a medical cover for posterity. Because I've got medical conditions, I've got PID, I've got this, I've got that. I want to be taken care of. For another one, what is it? Give I me got money. a child, I need to take care of the child. I want to be compensated for my lost opportunity. Yeah. I was raped at 16. I didn't finish school. I've got, another, I've got a child on the way. I've got, another, I've got a family also. What is going to happen to me? And what about, and this child is a citizen of Kenya. Responsibility to, to, to prevent, to protect, to defend is on the state. Mm. What NGOs do, what civil society does, is interim reparation mechanisms. Mm. Those are just kufunika tu, yani first aid. Mm. It's a first aid measure. Mm. But, I, but restoring the lives and the dignity of Kenya is solely about the responsibility Justice. of government. Yeah. 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 And now I've remembered my mandate. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a <scandal>. Reparation, <laughs> reparation yeah. self-agency and memorialization. What do you mean by self-agency? Because self -agency, I speak for myself. Remember I told you we used to be taken to conferences as, as, as mm. props. Yes. Mm. Yeah? You know when, so someone, when you go and give your testimony, Ideally, what you're trying to do actually is to share with them the extent of the injury and what it cost yeah. and what other women are going through and what this institution mm -hmm. that is saying that is, has been given support to actually work around this issue yeah. should be doing. Mm -hmm. Your voice is there to speak for others that are unable to speak. Mm -hmm. But Kumbe, you are just there. So when people are listening to your testimony, they are undressing you. Kumbe alifanyua. You know, mm -hmm. and, and they're visualizing you in a certain way. Yeah. And then also beyond that, you're just brought in just to you perform that function and then you're, you're left. Mm. There was no continuity, there was no posterity, there was no sustainability. Mm. And that was also very undignified. Mm. So that is when actually what seriously in, stimulated me into having my own organization. Yeah, okay. And I wanted it to be at the grassroots level. Yeah. Why? Because that's where the voice is. Where are you based? Madari. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I'm registered in Kibra, actually. Okay. Okay. But they were, you know, Kibra is about the, the, the most NGO zone in Africa. Maybe most, in Africa. <laughs> yeah, the most NGO zone in Africa. So yeah. I decided, but uh, uh, we have got um, interaction there. But we also have survivors in, in Mombasa. Okay. There's a woman, I, no, there's a girl who speaks for her mother who was raped and died. Oh, no. There are women who came from the Eldoret camps yeah. in, in, in Eldoret and they live in Naivashan governor's camp. There are women who were raped in, in Solai Nakuru. Kalenjin's Kikuyus. She was raped. She's a woman. Her husband died, left her because she was raped. She cannot even face her own children and her own daughters-in-law who oh. came and covered her. There's a woman who had mother and daughter were both violated. Mother got HIV, daughter gave birth to a baby. Solai Nakuru, the same way. Um, Transoya, you know, there's a very rich Kikuyu community there because of farming. Yeah. I mean, ki, let me just say this Kikuyus gave birth to Luos, Luos gave birth to Kalanjins, mm. Kalanjins gave birth to Kikuyus, so many. It's, it's a it's whole a mix. That, in Nyamira, it also happened because of the tea, mm. because of the tea estates. Yeah. In Kisumu, Muhoroni, a child, a boy, is right now got a mental health condition because he saw what policemen did to his mother. 
So she, they, she had to relocate and go and live in Shags because the, the boy stopped going to school in Form 2 mm. because he couldn't cope. Because he saw his mother being raped by two administration policemen. Mm. And it has traumatized him and traumatized her for, I mean, forever. Then a, a woman with disability in Busia, mm. she could not run. She just found sitting the way she, we, we were sitting here, mm. taking care of her sister's kids. And she was violated in, the, in her sister's house. She was taking care of her sister's children. So, and she got a child because of that. She hated the child. Hated. And many of them hates the, ch hate the children. Yeah, how, then how do you, what is it you tell mothers who have children? You must them? process the pain. You must come to terms so, with the it's pain. It's a process. Mm -hmm. you, you, have have to, you, you have to go through a process. A process, and it's personal. Mm -hmm. There's the part for counseling, but there's the part of your own self-reflection and connecting with yourself mm -hmm. and deciding, do I want to go ahead? Remember she said for how many years? Three, two and a half years. Yeah. Two and a half. Depression and coping mechanism, alcohol. Mm. There are many who do that. Others worse. We just decided to speak mm. about it. Mm. Okay? I so now these children, yeah. these ones that are rejected, are the ones that now we want to bring on the table and mm. to have that conversation. Mm. While we, 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 uh, we're going to talk about the, the sec, um, sexual violence, as, a, as, as sexual violence, we want to talk about children as a byproduct of a violation. The responsibility of the state, the responsibility of Kenya, mm. and they are old, mm. and they are old, mm. yeah. But do you let them know they are a product of it? That is now a personal decision with the parents. Mm. Ah, so yeah. you decide personally when. Disclosure I'm... is up to the parent. Mm. You cannot force such a such a decision. My child, you know the children are now fourteen years old. Mm. From two or seven up to now, they are fourteen years old. Yes. They ch you know today my daughter was asking me, "Ma, unenda mapema leo ten unenda wapi?" Huh? <laughs> Again, what you, does she know what, what you do? Did she actually ask me today, Unaongianga nini sayote? <laughs> <laughs> so today I told her, I'm going to talk about sexual violence. Oh, mm -hmm. so you know, it's, it's, she, and you know, she's the last one, she's the baby, so she's got baby mentality. She's 14 years old, but in Kama, Ni last one. Ni last one. So, mm -hmm. so <laughs> she's grasped it, but she's not grasped it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and nobody has ever told her, because she came into the household when I didn't have a husband. Mm -hmm. Okay, he had already died. Yeah. So he, she has seen all the other children don't have a dad. Mm. So it's normal. Mm. Yeah. And then there's so many single parents and single households mm. these days. Mm. So it's it, it's not really stigmatized her. But she's she's now keen because there's a poem that she says mm. that I am a tree surrounded by many others just like me. Mm. I started as a seed but planted differently. Mm. But I'm just as beautiful as others you see. That's wow. her poem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then also it goes back to what Jackie was saying. The choice, choice, mm. and one of the things that we are failing at the national level as a country is actually co-creating interventions Absolutely. with survivors. Mm. Because if you listen to survivors, mm. they all have solutions, and the the choice to make a decision, and if you help them to understand the reason why we are holding these people accountable, mm. you can you can have two parallel processes where they are saying this is for me but this is the responsibility of the mandate to hold the person who has violated mm. so if we help them understand that and the assumption is uh, what Jackie was saying people talk to or at, at survivors yeah. mm. as working with the assumptions that survivors don't the don't mm. have the capacity mm. or expertise to inform mm. interventions, mm. and that's a, a wrong that assumption wrong. Mm. Uh, because they have the they have the capacity, they mm. have the expertise, and they have the resources yeah. and the experience. Yeah, and the experience. Because most of the time, what we do is when you get a survivor, we are not saying all survivors are the same. Mm. There are those who are well off. Yeah. So when when you are working with the assumption of unezen the hospital you mm. pesa, mm. they haven't told you they don't have money. You, oh. you should actually direct them and tell them, yeah. go to facility A, you will find they're providing one, two, three services. Yeah. And then from there, let us know, because there is also a uh, follow-up. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to co-creation of interventions, you're putting the survivor at the heart of the conversation. This is meaningful engagement, not coming to see, sit in a meeting where we are saying, we have survivors in the room, mm. so survivors participated. Mm. Did you listen to what they said? Because mm. one, survivors are not homogeneous. Mm. Survivors of sexual violence, what survivors of sexual violence would require is not what mm. survivors of domestic violence mm. would require. Mm. And that's why 
uh, with a specific fo focus on sexual violence, even within that, there are survivors who have gone through rape in a domestic setup mm -hmm. or while being trafficked. Mm -hmm. And you can't handle those groups mm -hmm. the same. The same. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are saying the state is failing to listen to survivors. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. the interventions are not survivor-centered. Mm -hmm. They are not trauma-informed. Mm -hmm. They are not in the best of interest of survivors. Mm -hmm. Safety and security is not paramount when they are coming when they are following up with survivors or having conversations with survivors, all these things, we need to sit down and listen to survivors. The way you handle a man is not the same way you will handle a female survivor and, or a child. So things are, are different. And the one, things we, one of the things that we need to continuously insist on, the voice, the choice, and the agency of the survivor. Yeah. Yeah. I want to bring the conversation to Jackie, to Jackie on the yeah. point of reparations. Mm. You know, usually during a court system, correct me if I'm wrong, you take some, you know, there's a perpetrator and there's yeah. a survivor. Yeah. Perpetrator found guilty. Mm. If they, um, if, if during also, for example, if you're found guilty of a theft, mm. they say your money in a chukuliwa, then they compensate. Mm. The, this, isn't that the natural process? Mm -hmm. uh, that is reparations. I'm what is it? It is. In the same way. But now here we are. Survivors are in the document in the Working Commission, in the TJRC, KNCHR, Human Rights Watch, <laughs> OHCHR. <laughs> are those ghosts or what are those? Those are people. Yes. Those are statistics. Mm. So it is the responsibility of the state mm. to repair the lives of these people who have been part of, been part of this process. Mm. Because we also all did not have documents to take us to litigation. Mm. But we exist in documents. Mm. That means some, somebody somewhere got something right. Mm. Yeah? Mm. It was not an enormous, it was not a madman who can put this sexual violence in five plus documents and say that they don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You said um, something else? Yeah, no, I just wanted to kind of echo what um Wangu and Jackie here are saying. Yeah. And I'm thinking of, you know, what she highlighted, the state's responsibility. Mm. Um and I'm just looking back and reflecting on, you know, on a certain client who was actually raped by by a colleague. Mm. And, you know, when she went to the police station, mm -hmm. uh, why didn't you scream, you know, loud yeah. enough? Mm -hmm. You know, it was after a night out. So why, you know, why did you go out with your friends and etc. And that's not, you know, that's, that's not the mandate of the, of the police, one, to ask that. Mm -hmm. They had a role to investigate and they failed to do that. Um, and so, but also what really, again, to autonomy and the voices of survivors. Uh, what I love about this, you know, this client was she said, yes, there's the, the criminal aspect going to court, but I, ha I, I feel like the police have violated me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, from that I realized that really she really wants to hold the state accountable. So mm -hmm. that became a strategic litigation mm -hmm. case. So no matter the outcome, you know, of the criminal case, she, I think for her, what was disturbing her was, you know, she, she just thought, you know, the police would do their job. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they ended up, you know, kind of harassing her. And so I'm thinking of what, you know, what Wangu is yeah. saying um, and all that. And also one thing she, you know, she kept mentioning was, um, I'm okay and I'm ready to take, because, you know, with strategic education cases, they take a long time. Um, I'm okay with that. I just need counseling, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was saying it is not enough. And. You know, justice looks differently um, for survivors. Yeah. That is satisfaction, which is part of the parish. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Dickie, what, what, are you, what, what are your thoughts on this? So, I am a victim, and I tell you, me at a sitaki when I What What happens when somebody tells you that as a prosecutor? Well, as a prosecutor, remember we come uh, to at the end, almost at the end of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. When um, I'm ready to go to court and a victim tells me I'm not ready for this, mm. two things would, uh, would come to me. One, the big question would be why? And I speak this uh, having also started my life on the other side, mm. the civil society where I dealt with the post-election yeah. um, survivors. Mm. Um, and of course I would um, uh, endeavor, but what I must mention, even before we go there, as we are doing our pre-trial, we have a needs analysis or a needs assessment for this victim. Are they ready to go to court? If not, are they willing to go to court? Again, you know, a file could be brought to me as a prosecutor and mm -hmm. I'm told, make the decision to charge or not charge. Mm -hmm. And I make the decision to charge because there is evidence, you know, that supports that yeah. case. But now I only remember that point of not seeing the, the victim yeah. when I'm making the decision to judge. I get to see the victim 
when it comes to the court process. Okay. And uh, at that point, uh, I realized that the new team does not want yes. court. Mm. They want um, a repair, uh, they want uh, you know a solution in another way. Mm -hmm. I would have to step back as a prosecutor mm -hmm. and let them process and also identify what is it they need. They do not want court. Um, and uh, as a state, uh, the prosecutor, I would have to hold back. Maybe she would come later or not. For now, when she has processed all the other things, yeah. she has gotten psychosocial support that maybe it's what she needed. Mm -hmm. uh, she has gone for medical treatment mm -hmm. and you know um, and can then the case continue without a victim no it can't be the state you the the the, the perpetrator i mean because your state what are let me let me yeah. even um okay having gotten a survivor who has documented mm -hmm. the the whole process where there is a medical report the investigations were done and they were actually maybe a DNA process where mm. it actually linked up that this person yeah. committed this crime and the case has been presented to ODPP. Mm. My, from where I sit, when you're saying a case is against the state. Mm. You're losing the victim again. The uh, no, you're, the case is against the state. Mm. So my assumption is in the absence of the complainant, this, the case should proceed mm. because if you don't hold this person accountable, what does it mean? Mm. You're not, you're not holding this person accountable, but then they will continue violating other people. Oh, so yes, the, the case is, is against mm, yeah. the state. It's yes. not against the state. It's actually the, the state, state against the state. Yes. 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 I think what you're trying to ask, yes. at what point do we say that you have funds or quack or now? Okay, uh, at time, uh, the, the standard is that <laughs> we, we, could, uh, we must proceed with that matter. Remember, even as uh, the, the victim or the survivor wants to do other things, mm -hmm. we need now to have the court process, the legal process. And um, like you're saying, you were friends of that uh, we will not just be having cases of the survivors come and say, we mistake a mm -hmm. That would create another avalanche of, you know, perpetrators mm -hmm. who want to actually abuse everyone yeah. because they know a uh, survivor at Afrika Pale, a mm -hmm. I do not want to continue with the case. Yes, so uh, of course there are innovative ways of continuing with the matter without the presence mm -hmm. of the, uh, mm -hmm. the survivor or okay. the victim. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I have a question, Dominique. Mm -hmm. um, you, we launched, ODP launched a rapid reference guide to prosecution of SGBD cases. What has it? What new thing has it brought to the table? Uh, I must admit. Um, um, we did on 28th of July this year, we launched that uh, rapid reference guide. Uh, this rapid reference guide is just um, a, 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 a tool that uh, is used by prosecutors and of course other state uh, stakeholders to make it easy for them to prosecute uh, GBV or SGBV cases. Um, it brought out the evidence, you know, the, the kind of laws that we need to rely on and any other documents that we need to rely on. So it's a tool that helps the prosecutors and to an extent other members of the criminal justice to be able to deal with SGBV cases in a, in a more organized way, a neat way and fast for the prosecutors to be able to take the... Um, the, the matter through the courts, uh, the is judicial a, system. Yeah, is there a duration for how long these cases should take? Uh, at, at the moment, no, but I remember last week I was in um, Mombasa, the launch of the uh, SGBV CUC, and uh, I had the Chief Justice say initially a case could go ex uh, to an extent of, um, of, uh, of five years, yeah. you know, a period of five years, mm -hmm. but she's, uh, she promised or she committed mm -hmm. to have the matters, uh, the, the, the number of, you know, uh, the period mm -hmm. reduced to about, I think, one and a half years, if I'm not wrong, uh, at most, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we are hoping this is going to be uh, handled with the seriousness. Mm, of course, uh, we could, uh, the Chief Justice could say it will take one and a half years, but remember, mm -hmm. delay is not just about the judiciary and prosecution. Yeah. At times, other factors play into, the, you know, the delay of the matter, but we are hoping all that is going to be capped into one and a half years yeah. going forward. Okay. Yes. Right. Elsie, I cut you short. Mm -hmm. uh, no, um, I was just thinking about, um, you know, what you know, what Jackie is speaking about in terms of um, 
and also what Wangu highlighted when the survivor doesn't want to you know to go forth and that's the thinking that um, you know Lady Justice Kome had in mind uh, with the launch of the specialized you know with the specialized courts yeah. I don't think that was her you know her number one priority coming in but it was something that was brought to her attention um, and I mentioned this about the length of time but it wasn't just about length of time for her um, if you if you if you um, if you look at what she spoke to, it was that courts need to take a survivor-centered approach, and it's the entire criminal justice system, mm -hmm. the prosecution, you know, and everyone. So it's not, it's about a, a survivor-centered approach. So it's not necessarily, and I like the emphasis that Wangu is saying, mm -hmm. that this doesn't happen, you know, again. Um, and I just want to bring us back to, you know, the recent rulings, um, you know, since September, mm -hmm. uh, kind of curtailing, you know, the mandatory minimum sentences. Mm -hmm. If you look back um, back to those days when, you know, several women's rights organizations and human rights organizations came together and said there's a need for a sexual offenses act, a special one, because what was there was um, sexual offenses, rape, defilement and all that okay, were put under the penal code as a moral, you know, kind of like a moral crime. Mm -hmm. And what had happened then uh, during the late President Moe's regime was yeah. there was a school where the boys, you know, the boys stormed into the girls' dorm. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, and defiled them. Mm -hmm. um, and what came out was the head teacher just saying, you know, the boys didn't, you know, they, it's, it's so it's casual. Hormonal, it we are taking, hormonal. yeah, it was hormonal. We, like, it was so rampant. And the media really, you know, played a huge role in it. Um, and so there's, and there's something, there's a reason why it needed to, you know, have a special place and like I mentioned it's because of the long-term effects and I think she's spoken about it we can never really repair that dress mm -hmm. um, you can't really get back to that position mm -hmm. and that's why there's a need for that and as long we say so that it doesn't happen again mm -hmm. there's a need to have those man it's punitive mm -hmm. it's punitive there's a need to have um, you know the mandatory minimum sentences in place and if you look at those judgments if you analyze those judgments you would also see kind of the judges are speaking to Romeo and Juliet situations, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, when, when teenagers are having sex. Mm -hmm. But you see the ODPP already has a cure for that with the diversion program. Yes, yes. yes but it will not negate the fact that they defiled each other, will it? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let it remain as is because if you're talking about these children, there's already a program. So um, maybe a bit of background, and I had you yes, and, uh, yes. and uh, Lady Milady <laughs> <laughs> speaking about it. What yeah. is this petition about? Yeah. So okay. Somebody who doesn't get it. Yeah. What is it about? What do you want done? Yeah. Um. Again, back to you know state, you know, kind of state responsibility. Yeah. So the petition is actually, um, you know, not the petition in, in in what you term like petition, but we are petitioning and appealing to the Chief Justice as the Supreme Court because I mean one of the decisions of from the appellate court. Um, to just say, hey, there's, if you look at also those decisions, it's about, it's, it's um, of course, under the Constitution, the, you know, there are rights of accused and etc. But there's a lot of focus on that in terms of number of years and what it's like, where is the survivor's voice in all of this? Why is, why did this need, you know, a kind of special act on its own? And so what we're doing today, of course, a number of um, CSOs is just highlighting uh, to the Chief Justice we need to remember why um, this was important for survivors, that it be separate. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's an advocacy thing, and of course we're turning it um, around this, but it's something we've been speaking about since, you know, since those rulings came. Mm -hmm. I know um, the ODPP has, you know, has sought to stay and is going to appeal to the Supreme Court. And so what we're trying to do is, even at the moment on the ground, be that moment, I mean, let survivors speak, and I let, I let Wangu speak, because yeah. actually the movement is for survivors. Yeah. We did not want to kind of take a center stage. Ours is just to organize. Mm -hmm. But it's, they'll speak, and, you know, and that will come out. Um, and, you know, Wangu will speak to more of the details for today. Yeah, so um, why is today important? Why yeah. is the procession important? Um, so the reason why the procession and the petition is important mm -hmm. is for one, when we are saying survivor, a survivor-centered approach, when, when you look at some of the judgments and rulings that are being made uh, from a, an individual's point of view, you can be influenced by culture, tradition, and religion. And I think the reason why the Sexual Offenses Act has the minimum sentences is to actually guard against the beliefs of an individual. Because if you come from a community where um, having a sexual relationship with a 10-year-old doesn't matter, is a normal thing, yeah. mm -hmm. then Ke uh, Kenya is not... Uh, Kenya is protecting 
the, the, the citizens, mm -hmm. and in this case also children. Yeah. So by having the minimum sentences, mm -hmm. it's giving direction to either magistrates or judges to ensure that at the end of the day, the survivors um, are heard, mm -hmm. but then also ensuring that whatever sentences are issued um, are equivalent mm -hmm. of the violation. Because mm -hmm. if you defiled, let's say the three-year-old, mm -hmm. Uh, the three days baby and then <coughs> you issued a sentence of a one month sentence mm -hmm. what are you telling the general public that it's okay to do that and then we are creating a foundation for people to continuously continue abusing and violating other people mm -hmm. so we need to hold people accountable mm -hmm. and we need to uphold what the law has provided for because mm -hmm. even um under the constitution, there is more emphasis on the offenders mm -hmm. than the survivors. Mm -hmm. When people are, uh, are being given presidential pardons, mm -hmm. people look at the perpetrators, they don't bring the survivors' voices into the conversation. Because yeah. we've had instances where uh, sexual offenders yeah. are released mm -hmm. without the knowledge of the survivor. Mm -hmm. Imagine. And that's wrong. That's you that's actually wrong. need, you you need to consult the survivor and ask the survivor mm -hmm. And why are we giving presidential pardons to sexual offenders? Yeah. Oh, they get? Yeah. yeah, we had two incidences. Mm -hmm. And immediately they came back to the community, Did they ended up in the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, when we are saying survivor-centered, <laughs> is bring survivors and have conversations around the different issues that we are having mm -hmm. through the criminal justice system. Because yeah. that's the only way we can... Can I you raise your hand? <laughs> yes. Yes. I just want to build on what you yeah. said. What survivor-centered is? Uh, it's engaging the survivor from conception. Mm. Do you know how you conceive? <laughs> from conception to design mm. to implementation. Yeah. That is what survivor centered is. In other words, it's called co-creation. Mm. So that we are at the same table designing something that is going to that that is going to um, endure perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because and that is also another it's a long term way of evaluating a program mm. and for sustainability of a program. Mm. Okay? Yeah. Come we have moved away from participation. There was inclusion. Inclusion of what Wango said. You bring to the we were brought to the mm. table. Yes, we uh, they were there. I probably didn't even speak or I just mm. just mm. registered my name mm. on, on, on the registration form. Mm. That was just inclusion. Mm. Then there was participation. Mm. Yes, what do you have to say? Yes, I will I listen to you. I don't necessarily take into consideration. Mm. Then after participation there was now what? Uh, implementation, implementation together. But now we're moving from that. Mm. Now it's co-creation. Yeah. From conception to design to, to implementation. implementation, that equals sustainability and equals survivor-centeredness. But right. my final thoughts. Mm -hmm. I know my very Wait. final. Wait, no, you give me your final thoughts. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Jockey, yes. back to you. <laughs> we are talking about a survivor-centered approach to handling trauma mm. in your in your experience. Mm. I, I know you've met both survivors and perpetrators. I know the case for survivor-centered is very strong, mm. but then stopping all this SGPV also calls for us to deal with perpetrators, to deal with a seed that has been planted in a child that it's okay to to hurt another or to mm -hmm. sexually violate. Mm -hmm. You know it starts from a very small age. Yeah. Your bra your boy runs to you and tells you, Mommy, I forcefully kissed ka baby a mm -hmm. You know I'm a baby. Then mm -hmm. grows up to a certain age, he forcefully did something even worse now mm -hmm. on a girl in their class. Mm -hmm. so, no, so how do we deal? Mm -hmm. What is what are your thoughts on dealing with the root cause? Mm -hmm. Before we re so that we reduce the number of survivors, mm -hmm. how do we deal with the perpetrators? I will give you three examples of yeah. cases I've dealt generally yeah. that has dealt with trauma. And one of them started with my parenting class. Yeah. And I was talking about... <laughs> now you need to go. I wanted to go and learn about parenting. I found myself in a child and adolescent certificate yeah. class. Yeah. And I was going through that. It was the time post-election violence had just come in. Yeah. And people had been put in centers and counselors were required to go and support. So I found myself in Kiradimo camp mm -hmm. supporting children and the families. So after these classes you graduated now to start supporting? No, well uh, you're there, you know you have to do your practicum. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, so now, and then if you're called when there's a crisis, mm -hmm. you present yourself. Mm -hmm. So we're called to support. So mm -hmm. the college as I was doing was supporting this Keradimo camp. And some of the conversations where you're talking about this person, the, the, the survivor, mm -hmm. have you really asked them what they want? 
it is very easy to talk to children and support them as first aid. But as a grown-up, do they want to go that? In every counseling session, you start with the client. Mm. What do you want? Mm. What has brought you here? It is not about Njoki as a counselor say, I think this is the direction you should mm. go. Mine is to offer support. Mm. So in Keralimo camp we go, and, and I think this is a place where we are having a disconnect when yeah. we have programs. Mm. So we go, and we go maybe four or five sessions. Years later, these children mm. who watched things being done to their parents, mm. who watched people being murdered, mm. where are they now? Who is counseling them now mm. when they are 18, mm. 19, 20 years now? Mm. How much of this trauma has affected their livelihood until now? Another a second of, uh, example I'll give you is now later on mm. in into counseling and, and, and you know, and I was working in Kiambu, Kiambu Lokot under the children's mm -hmm. welfare and you remember there's a time Kiambu had a lot of those yes. issues, murder and all those yeah. things and children would be brought there as a first aid because this person, maybe a mom killed a dad and all that and you're doing first aid but after that this child is moved away from you there's no way of supporting them. There are no mechanisms, there's no money of supporting to make sure that this person has healed. Mm -hmm. Then, in, because of this situation also, there is the person, a parent who has died and they have gone, mm -hmm. but there's also a, pass, a parent who has been taken to prison. Were they really prepared to, about that, what was talked about? Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, thirdly, I'm going to talk about a personal initiative that mm -hmm. I'm very interested in, mm -hmm. and it came still from experience in counseling and mm -hmm. what, what she was talking about, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. And I support her a lot, YCTC in committee mm -hmm. and Kamai girls, where the cases she's talking mm -hmm. about. The Romeo and Juliet, so the boys are there because made a girl pregnant and, and there, and we kept on thinking. With this information, Joki is learning about it every day, every day. Mm -hmm. How is it helping her? And we thought, why not bring support? Why not bring <coughs> the other teenagers mm -hmm. to hear these stories? Because they will learn from other people that this is wrong, this is how you treat a, a woman, this is how you treat a lady. You start conversations at that level. Majorly, it's not even to go and show them people in prison behave like this. Yeah. And the children in YCTC yeah. and Kamai girls, they talk about their experiences and they tell them, this is where I went wrong, this is where I went wrong. So you're supporting on both sides. I, I want to really applaud mm -hmm. people generally in conversation, especially my brothers who are here, mm -hmm. when they see something happening in social media mm -hmm. and calling it out mm -hmm. for what it is. Mm -hmm. Because it will just start with a conversation of somebody being like uh, throwing a verbal word, yeah. but it starts building, it becomes a seed. Mm -hmm. If it's not well controlled or stopped at that point, it grows up to be a yes. fruit. Yeah. So there's a social media aspect of that. Our working places somebody is told something in front of you and you keep quiet you don't know that tomorrow it will be you mm. you are the person at that time to address it and say excuse me mm. whatever you have done is wrong it is not expected mm. many times you've seen people justifying people being removed their mm. clothes in public but sometimes it just takes one person to say no mm. will not do that i wish these conversations can even go to school School, these small children, children that we are having. Because imagine, family, yes, or oh, actually family. Mm. If actually yeah. there's, there's a bit of family, but imagine if you're in a violent family, mm. this conversation mm -hmm. would be done there. But at least in schools, we have a structure mm. or community mm. where people are talking about these things. That a boy will be taught when you pinch or you do or kiss, mm. this is what. So we are also correcting certain behaviors. Mm. But the saddest thing, and uh, because we all live in communities, what is also our role as our community leaders where we are staying? Because you hear, mtu wa mpiganduru huku, mtu wa mpiganduru, the second time wa mpiganduru, the third time wa zama, ah, ah, watu wa me? Wa mezoea. Ah, watu wa nashindanga hivo, wa metuchokesha. Until one person's life is taken. And then you say, ah, eh, walikuanga tu hivo. But, and then you see people justifying as Wango is saying, say, ati, ah, there has to be somebody who will stand up and say no. Because it will just start something small like this and then it ends up in rape. So anybody, the space that you are in, talking about it, 
probably even having those programs that everybody is talking about. Mm -hmm. How inclusive are they? Are they talking about the children who are there? Mm -hmm. We need to draw from the experiences mm -hmm. of the survivors and mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. this is what we would have wanted. Yeah. These are some of the things that can be implemented. Mm -hmm. I think finally I will say, how are we handling these people, the survivors? Mm -hmm. People speak, sometimes it is shameful. Sometimes people don't want to talk about it. Let it just be my personal yeah, secret yeah. and it is okay. Yeah. But presenting them there mm -hmm. as, uh, as she will say, when you say a props or a kagini pin mm -hmm. of, of some <laughs> sort, and then you leave them, what was the use? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have to have a lot of not care sensitive. and sensitive. Mm -hmm. But counseling is also not cheap, my dear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the government should have a certain sector in that hospital where when you go to report mm. in that hospital when you're going for your examination or is it the, pro, the police station that they should have that counselor there trained not just any counselor because mm. then we can just use our, our yeah. normal issues can we have that and one stop as she's saying so that you're not moving from this place to this place so that you're not only handling the legal aspect the medical aspect but you're also handling the psychological so, aspect yeah. of it so that even by the time a person is making a decision that they want to go to court mm. then they are stable mm. if they decide they don't want to go but they're also on a mental state mm. what i'm saying is it Everybody in this country has a role to play. Mm -hmm. Psychosocial support from the house, from the house that is there. Your neighbor, it just starts with that person. Mm -hmm. If you don't to address issues of what is happening in the next door, mm -hmm. you could be the next victim yeah. mm -hmm. and you never know. Mm -hmm. So it is very important that we keep our eyes open. Talk. When you see something is going wrong, talk. Mm -hmm. Talk. Create awareness. Talk, 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 talk. We cannot mm -hmm. have enough of talking. Okay, yeah, but, so but to add on to um, the mental health component, so there was a mental health bill that was enacted mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah. The, we are in the process of implementing it. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to your first question, yeah. um, do we have enough laws and policies in place. In place. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my answer is yes. yes. The problem is actually implementation. 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 Mm -hmm. And yes. implementation must be accompanied <coughs> by enough resources yes. allocated to ensure that everything is in implemented to the letter. Mm -hmm. So I can say we, we have, we, because most people ask, do we have government goodwill? I would say no. That's where I'm from, where I'm sitting, because if we have government, government goodwill, it will be equals the amount of money the government of Kenya has allocated <laughs> and broken down to the smallest item or commodity that is required to address mm. sexual violence. Right now, if I even asked Jackie how much money um, Kenya has actually allocated to address sexual violence, whether it's towards prevention, protection, or response, mm. and broken down. Nobody knows. Mm. And when we raise those questions, nobody is willing to answer us. Mm. Yes, there are commitments. Mm. But then when you say commitment, one, two, three, mm. and then we have $20 billion, yes. then uh, where is it? Who is it going mm -hmm. to? Because we have a multi-sectoral um, approach towards uh, addressing sexual and gender-based violence. And yeah. you need to know how much money has been given to ODPP towards <laughs> what? <laughs> how much <laughs> money yeah. has gone to Ministry yeah. of Health yeah. towards yeah. what? Yeah. How much money has gone to Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Interior towards what? How yeah. much money has been given to witness protection? Yeah. So we can't just say there's government political goodwill mm -hmm. when there is no resources mm -hmm. that is actually showing the commitment. And the government should be at the forefront leading by example yeah. and this goes back to mm. the government uh, the president he needs to stand and say i'm leading by example and this is the way we are going good so now jackie <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ODPP is invested in sgbv yes yes <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I, I think oh, one go, one one go. Go. Yeah. of course um, um ODPP has invested in SGBV in different ways. Mm. Training of our prosecutors. Mm. Now you can see we're also investing in sensitizing yeah. the members of the public. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, very many things are, 
of course, um, public education, yes. which we are doing today, uh, training of our prosecutors to be able to deal with these cases uh, in, um, and of course, uh, the materials that they should use in uh, uh, achieving the objective when it comes to prosecution of sexual offenses uh, and other, you know, related offenses. Apart from that, um, we are uh, we here. We've also in, uh, invested in the wellness really not fully yeah. of our prosecutors yeah. when it comes to and that includes um we are now heading towards uh, investing in the psychosocial support yeah. for the uh, prosecutors who deal with um, SGBV, murder cases, and, you know, mm -hmm. because we need to be okay mm -hmm. before we deal with the survivors. And the question I always ask when I'm in such forums, are we okay? Mm -hmm. And when I talk about are we okay, not just the prosecutor, are we okay as the people dealing with the survivors yes. of SGBV? Yes. Because you cannot send a sick person to deal with other sick people. Mm -hmm. So as uh, DPP, we are also, uh, as uh, ODPP, we are also progressing towards having, um, we might not have them internally, but identifying prosec um, psychosocial, uh, you know, counselors mm -hmm. to deal with our prosecutors mm -hmm. so that they are able to deal yeah. with uh, SDBV cases. I, I must not uh, stop there. I must say Wango um, needs to know what resources are invested in the Ministry of yeah. Health. We can be talking about coordination and cooperation mm -hmm. and then going individual mm -hmm. in institutions. Mm -hmm. We would need to think of an innovative way. If it's counseling, um, resources for counseling, let us have them in one place and let them be distributed within our core mandates. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we are the people who are defeating that course. Mm -hmm. When we say we need to know how much a police uh, has been given, ODPP, are we not again saying talking of cooperation and coordination and then breaking it down at that point? Mm. So can we think of innovative ways where we are going to have one large basket with all the resources that we can tap into when uh, and within our core mandates, yeah. so mm. that we are the, the the government is giving us so much to deal with these uh, issues. Okay. Yes. Thanks. So I I, w I want us to wind up, but I need to ask some questions that have come. Uh, some two three questions. One is, um, Duncan Ondimo says, uh, I need to pass my appreciation to the guests for the support in ensuring minimum mandatory sentences remain. Amazing discussion on how survivor-centered approach to justice. So mm -hmm. Duncan Ondimo says thank you and supports the survivor-centered approach to justice. And then now there's a question here on Facebook. Uh, my biggest question, Carol Kaya, thank you for asking and for engaging with us. My biggest question is how do you take back a child to the same environment after she sexually assaulted and considering that the suspect has been released on bail and bond on the same environment? Mm. Yeah. Anyone? Ah, <laughs> uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think uh, we are living in times where um, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to law and especially the laws uh, around the children mm -hmm. and uh, women and any sexual violence. Uh, yeah. We have seen quite a number of judgments coming out of the court. Mm -hmm. This morning I was also reading about a situation where a child has been taken back to yeah. an environment where they are abused. So um, uh, it, it becomes a bit hard because this is a, a, a process that has gone to the judiciary. Um, and. Uh, People have appealed that you remove a victim from that environment, but the the, the court reinforces its yeah. uh, judgment. Mm -hmm. So ordinarily, the child or the victim is not supposed to be taken to that environment. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be taken to a safe place. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, when I say we are coming from a very confusing situation where the prosecutors and everyone else is doing their work, but uh, we are seeing judgments mm -hmm. and um, and. Um, uh, ju uh, you know, uh, shocking judgments coming from court, mm. for lack of a better mm. word. Yeah, okay. I have I have a case probably I could highlight yeah. touching on that, mm. where uh, we're working with a, a team of advocates, and this particular child is the one who reported this case, mm. and the person who had molested her, defiled her, was released on those terms, and of course the community started talking about this. Mm. What is this? And this is happening. And with time, children became very withdrawn in that community mm. and very agitated. And of course, now people are wondering what is happening. And as we were coming in as counselors and starting to understand this, children started pointing <coughs> out. Mm. And we had 30 
children by the same person. What? But the conversation that had been there had been one. Wow. Now the reason why this these issues are not being discussed is because the children are thinking if this guy can He's come back, mm. so they will not talk. Mm. So it actually defeats the purpose that this person person will be brought back to the same environment. And even after he was brought back, he still held other children. Mm. So I think you keep on re-traumatizing, re-traumatizing, and also this person is continuing. It's like you're rewarding him mm. for his bad so behavior. Bad so I think we should have really good support mm. and uh, and find out how to support each other. Mm. Because it's one thing also to prosecute, but is even this person able to stand there mm. and really give evidence or give their part? Mm. And there's also the place of uh, how do we protect these children yeah. Anita, they're going through Anita, this. Anita, just yes. allow me to respond yeah. to, the, to that comment yeah. um, on the safe spaces. Um, indeed, of course, there's a need, like I highlighted, um, you know, for those safe spaces where people can, one, um, be able to, you know, get reprieve, but also heal. Yeah. Um, and that's the responsibility of the state. If you look at the, the NGEC guidelines, the National Gender and Equality Commission, they have very clear guidelines on, you know, the, how it is actually the state's responsibilities to provide that. And it's actually a national um, responsibility. Yeah. However, what we saw over COVID was it became kind of a, a inter-counties kind of competition, yeah? Mm -hmm. Which could be a good thing, could be a positive thing, <coughs> because it started, was it in McQueen or McQueen? McQueen, McQueen. McQueen, yeah. And then now, like for instance, Nairobi I know has two. Um, and, you know, is it really well known at the moment? No. But there have been uh, privately run, you know, kind of shelters that have been oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's to be, and it's actually, you know, the ODPP and the judges, and there's, I know one that really here in Nairobi that really takes in children, um, and they really need support. And who takes the children there? The police. Mm -hmm. You'd find the court saying, take, 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 but they are not, you know, they're not funded. Yeah. So should, should the state come in and fund already existing ones? Mm -hmm. Should this, you know, um, and so that's a conversation to have, mm -hmm. but it's something that is very necessary. But it also brings me to what Wangu was saying accountability. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, these victims are also, you know, the witnesses in the cases. So, witness protection agency, the victims, what, and reparations. Mm -hmm. We need to know this money that they're given uh, to <laughs> reparate victims. Yeah. Is it getting to them? How is it spent? Or is it all spent on salaries? Yeah. Um, and so we, it cannot be the CSO responsibility. For instance, if crew supporter, we cannot keep supporting shelters for a very long time. And that's actually the state's responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. But then also to add on to mm. the reason why I was saying we need to know the, the mm. reason why, re, how much mm. uh, budgets have been allocated. One, for example, if I send a survivor to a police station, and then they are charged for the P3. If they mm. send someone to a hospital and then they are charged for the post-rape care form, mm. yet the Sexual Offences Act is very clear that those support, su support services mm. are supposed free. to be op offered for, for free. free. Mm. Then how do we hold the different government accountable. institutions mm. accountable? Mm. And going back to, do we know how much money each and every police station is given for stationary? Mm. We start the conversation <laughs> <It's somewhere. laughs> for, shelter, for yeah. shelters. Um, we, we are having um, county governments uh, setting up uh, shelters. Mm -hmm. But then, you, it can't be a structure. Yeah. It has to have recurring yeah. cost yeah. and administration cost. Yeah. And that's why we are insisting, can we get to know how much money yeah. national government and county governments are allocating to address sexual violence either prevention, protection, or response, yeah. so that where there are deficits or where we don't have any budgets allocated, we can actually call them out and say, for mental health, you actually need to allocate this money. Because yeah. uh, the costing study that was done under the National Gender and Equality Commission, we spent survivors, the economic burden on survivors, mm. it's at 46 billion shillings annually. That yeah. can run three counties. Mm. Wow. Carol, can I ask again, uh, kindly take us through a simplest procedure from the commission of a sexual offense such as defilement to reparation. And I think we've talked about it a lot wow. here. Mm -hmm. Why we need reparation and mm -hmm. how we need to deal with the with the can, survivors. Can I, can I yes. finally give my final comment? Final, finally, finally, finally. <laughs> <yeah. coughs> I want to just come back to our hosts. Yeah. Um, DP Nurjin Hadi was, uh, that's his name, Haji. Mm -hmm. DP Haji was... Uh, <laughs> 
ODPP. Mm -hmm. yeah, we and shall blame it on the call. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, was recently in a in, in a, a, a conference that was supported by the UK government, yeah. uh, preventing sexual violence and conflict. And DP Nudin Haji went to talk about Bibi Pedro case. Mm -hmm. And he said that the things that uh, that made that when they were investigating the Bibi Pedro case, mm -hmm. they bumped into sexual violence. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, it wasn't bumped. It was. And bumped into sexual violence cases yes. when they were investigating the Bibi Pedro case. In other words, mm -hmm. sexual violence was not a priority. Mm -hmm. Not but a priority, but it was not brought to the attention of the DPP until they did. Should the it have been? Yes, by the investigators, right? And who investigates? This is my point. Yeah. Why would he go to a conference and talk about baby pendo and reparations for baby pendo while he was there to talk about sexual violence in conflict? Okay. My final I point. I wish he was here to answer that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I'll uh, give him the right of reply. But since he's a, he's a government officer, let it be known. I said that mm. in good faith. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. I was wondering, in, in these conversations that we've been having, and because of, of the issues of violence and trauma that we've had of counselors, the people who have said we can actually support. Because if you're living in this particular area, let's say you live in Kiskikuyu, and that is where there was, something has happened, you don't want to be returned to that environment. Mm. You want to be taken mm. to maybe mm. Tawala or mm. something. But there are people who are saying, we would like structure, who are counselors and maybe community leaders. Others, maybe their children have grown and they have these houses. But they also feel like, are we protected? Because people look for these people and they want to harm them. So looking at, even yes, the structures that have been put, but also mm. we have other alternatives mm. that can be used and say, can we support in those budgets yeah. that we can use other communities, other homes that are existing, so that we're not waiting for this humongous budget, mm. but start working with already what is what there. Yes. And okay. then correction, mm -hmm. these people are human beings and they are survivors. Mm -hmm. So they are not these people, mm -hmm. they are human beings. <laughs> <laughs> survivors. We love All right. All right, so finally, finally, and finally, Michael Black, and thanks for following. He asks, most of the challenges experienced in solving SGBV cases is at the point of reporting. Are the police on, um, on the OB desk yeah. trained on SGBV? Are they? Um, I must say, a few years ago, there was a, um, a project on gender desks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. this, uh, the people who sit there were supposed to have been trained on um, on how to manage SGBV cases, sexual offenses and any other uh, um, or any other offense, uh, the gender-based violence offenses. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, after that, we discovered that these desks were used as a punishment. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If you have if you are really in a disciplinary process, yes, you are yeah, placed at the yeah. gender desk to deal, mm -hmm. you know, you have not yeah. even dealt with your own issues mm -hmm. that have led you to being taken there. You are now help, trying to assist people. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the, should be the ideal situation. Have the desks with uh, very people, people who are sensitive, mm -hmm. been trained in sensitivity training on handling SGBV. And then they deal with, and they first deal with their issues, and then deal with the issues of uh, the others. Okay. So, but I have a finally, finally question mm -hmm. <laughs> from Ian Josh, and thank you again for following. There are people who have lied that they were sexually violated, only to admit after they weren't that they weren't. Mm -hmm. As the ODPP, how do you ensure that such laws are not abused? That's the skill of a lawyer. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Anita, I must say, even to deal with uh, sexual and gender-based violence yeah. issues, uh, and for you to be able to identify whether mm. it's true indeed. I remember, in a sexual offense, you have to use medical evidence mm. and mm. other kind of evidence, mm. not just allegations yeah. that mm. I was violated. Yeah. Mm. But even when you're not dealing in the circle of sexual violence and you're dealing with other forms of uh, offenses, it takes skills, you know, for you to be able to identify this mm. is not right, this is right, and this needs to be corrected. So it's something you learn over time, since there's no specialized training within um, these agencies that deal with... Uh, but I have colluded with my doctor, I have colluded with everybody to accuse Mr. So-and-so of sexually abusing me. Hmm. How, when is that discovered and what is done when it is discovered? Okay, first and foremost, mm -hmm. the one thing that we want to encourage anyone, and I'm saying this because we do not trust survivors most of the time, 
hence the reason why they don't mm -hmm. trust people trust, yeah. 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 to come out and speak because the first thing is what you are raising. Mm. Are you telling me the truth? truth. Mm. Yeah. It is my truth, not your truth. Mm. So you should allow me to tell my truth and then the medical reports, I'll go and report. Mm as Jackie said. I'll go and report. I'll come with a medical report. There is investigation. Mm -hmm. The case will come to prosecution. Mm -hmm. All these processes processes are actually to determine at the end of the day yeah. whether the, the crime took place or did not take place. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll ask you a question. People who steal, mm -hmm. do they lie? <laughs> mm -hmm. Why are we always uh, blaming when survivors they, yeah. or when people come out to mm. import cases of sexual and gender based violence which is wrong and we should, stop, mm. we should stop setting that precedent yeah. because we are denying people platforms to come out and tell their truth so that they are able to get access to justice support, yeah. make, uh, yeah. support services yeah. but also a reparation mm. yes. the threshold for, for, for sexual violence why, why is it so high mm -hmm. that you must Cream. Why didn't mm -hmm. anyone hear you? Yeah. Why oh, yeah. you don't ask someone why why they're walking uh, walking when they were stolen from? Like why 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 must survivors be asked? Why must the burden of proof yeah, be on the survivor? survivor. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole process that goes through it, and if that process is corrupt, then it's not because that then for those who actually go through it, it yeah. you know it, it takes them away from the system. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I need to end the show. I am getting the eyes. <laughs> let, me just, <laughs> let me just mention uh, what we are doing today. Yes. Uh, like I mentioned, so it's uh, we begin at Aga Khan Walk yeah. all the way to the Supreme Court uh, yeah. so that then we can hand over the petition to the Chief Justice. Right. And you know that walk of course is, is going to be filled by survivors mostly, but also the paralegals who are, like I mentioned, you know, work, yeah. work hand in hand with them, um, volunteering. And I think most of the times, even as advocates as we work, the guys who really feel that slap when, you know, when people are handed lower sentences, you'll find paralegals saying, after all that I've done, yeah. this person was given this, this. Mm -hmm. So we're working together um, to shed light on, on survivors' voices, yeah. but also to bring the attention to the Supreme Court. Okay. Uh, yes. But again, you also need to mention what is this petition? Is it yeah. court documents, you know, oh. or a lawyer? It's oh. the understanding yeah. is Oh, no, no, no. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's more of like a programmatic petition, yes. but that's not to say that, you know, as crew and other CSOs, because then the person who's actually um, appealing is the ODPP and I know yes. Jackie is, is on, yeah. on point on that to the mm. Supreme Court yeah. but like for instance as crew we are coming in as also an interested party mm -hmm. and then other women's rights organizations are coming in as amicus mm -hmm. but for us we're coming in because really we work a lot with survivors to give them that voice but yeah. also to support uh, to support Jackie because really it's a slap um, on survivors and also to the ODPP. Yeah. yeah. Okay so we have to end the show. I am worried about asking ladies to give a final word because we'll have Many final <laughs> words. <laughs> and maybe that's why you needed a, a gentleman here. <laughs> we will bring yeah, you But anyway, uh, thank you so much, ladies, uh, for your perspective. I think uh, the show took a different turn for me. I've learned something. Yeah. I was coming to discuss GBV, SGBV. Then I'm learning it is actually GBV, not just SGBV. Mm -hmm. And I've also learned, and I think everybody has learned, that we need to have a survivor centered approach, approach yeah. which also for me is a learning point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, we have to unschool our unconscious biases about uh, blaming survivors mm -hmm. and putting the burden of proof on the survivors. Mm -hmm. So we wish you well as you go and. Uh, and mm -hmm. engage in this uh, activity today Thank to cover more water. Senior Amicus. Yes. Where are the ODP? Oh, maybe okay. So, 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 thank you so much for those who engage with us online. Uh, you can continue asking, can you continue engaging. We'll definitely get uh, engagement going on a response. We appreciate that you took time uh, to join with us and discuss this. Mm -hmm. It's still quite a big thing, and I think for me, my what is still lingering is as we talk about survivor centered approach how do you reduce the number of survivors how mm. do we deal with perpetrators from the family unit how do we do that in primary school no asifike shule uskia mtoto wako ameenda girl school kutafuta ka girlfriend kake katikati ya usiku even the danger involved for this boy walking into this school and then of course above all a survivor centered approach to dealing with GBV and SGBV. Mm -hmm. So it's been a great show for me. I hope it has been for you. Courtesy of the ODPP, we want to educate, inform, and have conversations that actually uh, provoke her, our minds and our thoughts about things in our society and, of course, how to, to sort of um, behave in certain situations. 
bwanja mi lady bwanja amesema wango amesema it is just not these people but they are survivors and yeah. it is their story to tell and not yeah. ours so listen and listen more so thank you so much uh, we wish you well in the week and let's catch up again uh, for the next show god bless thank you yeah. thank you